My dear sisters and brothers in Islam, this week, this past week that we've lived in, perhaps is one of the craziest weeks in a very long time. First of all, it started with the earthquake that shook Turkey. And as I sat down and started to write about earthquakes and what Islam says about earthquakes, we see the rapid spread of the coronavirus. And we see some of what was really happening, which was hidden from us. We saw some of the reality and how serious this virus actually is. And then we wake up the next morning and we hear the news about the passing of the Mamba, Kobe Bryant. And then just a couple of days later, we hear about the so-called deal of the century, the so-called peace treaty, one thing after the other. And it's important when these type of events happen, that we realize that they happen for hikmah, for wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us as Muslims to stop and to reflect. When we look at the tragic death of Kobe Bryant, and it's important to point out, because we have two sides in the Muslim community. One side that if I were to stand here now and say, brothers and sisters, we're going to have a moment of silence to remember the great champion Kobe O'Brien. Could you all stand? You'd find brothers and sisters standing up. <laughs> Bismillah. And we see them on their Facebook pages, on social media. RIP, RIP. There's no resting of a peace with someone who dies on Kufr, man. It's not permissible to make dua for someone who died upon Kufr. He might have been a good guy. He might have had a lot of good. But if someone didn't die upon Iman, how are we going to make dua for them? And then you have the other side. Astaghfirullah. How can you even mention his name? How can you talk about someone like this? He was a kafir. Even if he was a non-Muslim, there's things we can benefit from his story. There's benefits we can benefit from how he died. This was major news. Something happened and something that impacted many of us who grew up watching him, who grew up playing basketball. It had a huge impact on us, let's be honest. And the way he died reminded us of the reality of death. That it doesn't matter how successful you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how famous you are. That when that prescribed time comes, you will meet death. You will taste death. Not one second as Allah told us in the Quran would be delayed because that's your prescribed time. When it's your prescribed time, you're going to go out of your norm perhaps to go to that, to that place at that time to meet the angel of death. Those other passengers on the helicopter, perhaps some of them never have even been on a helicopter. Perhaps some of them weren't accustomed to traveling on the private helicopter with Kobe. But because on that day, all of them had the same appointment at the same prescribed time, at the same prescribed place to meet the angel of death. Therefore, they went with him on that plane. Death will reach all of us no matter where we are. As Allah told us in the Quran, even if you were in a protected palace, that death will reach you. And that's why Islam teaches us as Muslims to constantly be prepared for death. Our beloved Prophet ﷺ told us, "Ukthiru dhikr Constantly remember the destroyer of pleasure, ayal mawt, death. Constantly think about death. When you constantly think about something, it's going to help you remember. It's going to help you remember 
death. Because even though none of us want to die, the reality is that it's going to find us when it's our time. If we could run from death, we would. And many of us, that's what we do. But what did Allah tell us in the Quran? قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِيرُونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ That say that the death you're running away from, that it's going to catch you. It's going to get you. And then what did Allah say in the verse? ثُمَّ تَرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Then you will be returned to the knower of al-ghaybi wa shahada the seen and the witnessed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He will inform you of everything that you did. You're going to be held accountable for everything. This is the reminder of death that we need to remind ourselves of. One of the reflections that we gain from his story, which one of our brothers had mentioned when he wrote about it, that how tragic it must have been at that time as a father. And many of us as fathers, we can relate to this, that we would do anything to protect our children. But at that time, you realize there's nothing you can do to save your own child, your own daughter, and all of you are doomed. A brother, when he heard me talk about this the other day on Facebook, in a video from Canada, he contacted me. <coughs> and he said, Jazakallah khair for what you said, it was very good, but there's a way that he could have protected her. I said, this is interesting. And this is what we get when we come together, we reflect on what we're seeing in front of us, what we gain as Muslims. He said he could have protected her if he had Iman. He could have protected himself if he had Iman. We know the hadith of the Prophet wasallam about the one who has three daughters and he raises them properly. If he had raised them properly with Iman, to know what is the purpose of life, it would have been a ticket for him to Jannah, and it, they would have been, inshallah, upon khair. The ones, who were, the ones who died and the ones who are still alive. The ones who died and the ones who are still alive, they would have been upon khair on good. Because they had iman. They had, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They know the purpose of life. When we look into the story of Kobe Bryant, we see someone who perfected that what he, that what, that what he did. He was a perfectionist. And his story is amazing. And this is what Islam teaches us. Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna allaha yuhibbu idha amil ahadukum amalan an yutqinahu. That Allah loves when one of you does something that he perfects it. And he left behind a legacy. And this is something, a very important principle and a great reminder for all of us. That it's not about how long you live, it's about how you live. Let me repeat that. It's not about how long you live, it's about how you live. And what you accomplish when you're here on this earth. What you do for yourself, for your family, and for your ummah. What you do for the society that you live in, and what you put forth for yourself, yawm al-qiyamah, when you come to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what's significant. And if we look into our ummah, we see examples. Kobe, he was only 41 when he died. But when we look into our ummah, we see examples of people who left legacies even better than his. At such a young age, they died as well. Imam an who died at the age of 45. And when you look at all the books that he wrote, and all that he did for Islam, and how everyone makes dua for him even till today and reads his books. That we even ask ourselves, how is it humanly possible that he accomplished all of that and he died at the age of 45? SubhanAllah. But when Allah gives someone tawfiq, He gives him the ability. And a person strives for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or even someone as we see who strives for the dunya. If you work hard enough, you'll get it. You'll obtain it. Look for example at the great Khalifa Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Radiallahu an, who passed away at the age of 38. Look at the legacy that he left behind. The great Sahabi, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, who passed away at the age of 33. Look at the legacy he left behind. So it's not about how long you live, it's how you live and what you do with the time that Allah has blessed you with. There's many things that we can gain 
And those of you who have heard some of my lectures in the past, you know that we can sit here and abstract benefit after benefit. Like we did when we gave the khutbah about our brother Kabib. And I mentioned 54 different things we benefit from his life. But we want to stop here when it comes to Kobe. And I think what we mentioned is enough, inshallah ta'ala. We want to stop and reflect on the coronavirus. Subhanallah. And what lessons this teaches us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَمَا, huh? وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُ And no one knows the soldiers of your Lord except for Allah. The soldiers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A virus that you cannot even see brings perhaps the strongest nation on the face of the earth down to its knees. Subhanallah. And we see most of the people on Facebook and this focusing on how they called Islam a virus and now a virus, what it's doing to them. How they banned the niqab and how now people are covering their face. That's interesting. But something that's really significant about what's going on or what happened that we forget is that when someone becomes an oppressor and what they did to our brothers and our sisters in China, from the Uyghur Muslims. And how every Muslim around the world who cares about their brothers and sisters, they raised their hands and made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and made dua against these dhalimeen, against these oppressors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered the dua inshallah. And that shows us and reminds us of the power of dua. Walhamdulillah. A question that comes to our mind when it comes to the spread of a plague. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread plagues, allow, spray, allow plagues to spread on earth? What is the hikmah? What is the wisdom? Because Allah is al-hakim. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, there's wisdom behind it. If we look into the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us clearly in different verses that these type of musaib and these calamities and it's bima kasabat aydin nas. It's what the people have done with their own hands. The corruption that spread throughout the earth. It's because of what the people have done. And they're getting punished for that. And the, in the verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that perhaps, that perhaps they yarji'oon. That they will turn back and come back to their Rabb. Come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are from the hikmas, from the wisdom. That they will be punished what they did and that they will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent. Another question that comes is what do we need to do in dealing with plagues as Muslim? There's two hadith in Sahih Bukhari. One of them, our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about his wife, by his wife Aisha radiallahu anha what to do at the time of a plague. Or asked him, she asked him about the, the plague itself. Is it a punishment from Allah? She asked him, is the plague a punishment from Allah? And he said to her, it's a punishment that Allah sent upon the people. But it's a rahmah, it's a blessing, a mercy for the believer. Allahu Akbar. As a Muslim, the way we look at things and the way we understand things is different. It's a punishment, it's a torment for the disbeliever. But for the mu'min, he said alayhi salatu wasalam, that it's a rahmah, it's a mercy, it's a blessing for us. And he said that there's no believer who is afflicted with the plague, in the place of the plague, where it spread. And he has sabr, he has patience, and he realizes, has the yaqeen, the certainty, that nothing will happen to him except for that what Allah has decreed for him. He has these two things, he said that he will get the ajr of the shaheed, the ajr of the martyr. If he has these two things, alhamdulillah. And the other hadith, the Prophet والسلام, he told us that we, if we hear about the plague in a place, that we stay away from it. That we, we take our precautions. Islam orders us, not just to think, khalas, if the qadr is going to happen, I'm going to go straight to where the plague is. If it's written for me, I'll get it. If it's, nah, that's, it's not what Islam is teaching us. He told us that if we hear about the plague in a land, then stay away from it. Don't go to that place. 
And he told us that if you are in a place, in a city, in an area that is afflicted with the plague, that you stay there until it passes. And what is the objective of this? So it doesn't spread and harm other people around the world. Subhanallah. Think about this nation, the strongest nation, perhaps on the face of the earth now, or one of them. Who that maybe if it continues, they will be completely isolated. None of their planes, none of their ships will be allowed to leave their borders. All of the trade that they've spread throughout the earth in the last couple of years, all of it will come into a stop. And it goes back to them oppressing and getting what they deserve from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this life before the next. My dear sisters and brothers in Islam, the recent so-called peace treaty. I don't want to get too much into politics. And I think many of these reminders that we've seen and that we've been reminded of today should have been iman moving for us. And we've talked about this issue in the past. But to comment with just one or two quick things. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, They plan and Allah plans and the law is the best of planners. Alhamdulillah, the khair will always be to the muttaqeen as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. The situation of the ummah being humiliated like it is, we always want to point the fingers at the outside parties. When the fingers we should be pointing comes back to ourselves. Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about a dhul, a humiliation that will be placed upon the ummah and the only way it will be raised is how. He told us, alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, Lan Allah ankum. The Allah will not raise it from you. Hatta Until you repent, until you come back to your deen. So we don't come back to our religion. We have this emulation. And the next one and next one that will come to the ummah. This is the reality, unfortunately, of what's happening to the ummah today. My dear brothers and sisters, these events that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us throughout this last week needs to remind us of the importance of preparing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The importance of returning to Allah. From the signs that Yawm al-Qiyamah is close, that it's near. Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that from the signs of the hour being close is sudden death. And we just saw that in the example that we mentioned. And we saw the sudden death, and we see it time and time again, day in and day out, where people were just dropping. Whether it be in a car accident, whether it be with a heart attack, people were just dropping and dying, subhanAllah. And he mentioned, alayhi salatu wasalam, from the signs is the earthquakes. And how many earthquakes have we seen? Two major ones just in this last week in Turkey, also in Jamaica. And maybe more that I don't know myself. Earthquake after earthquake, Allah shaking the ground to remind us to return to him. As he told us in the Quran that he sends the ayat, إِلَّا تَخْوِيفَ To scare us, to remind us, to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a true believer, when he sees events happening in the life that he lives, may Allah have mercy upon those who died upon iman and went through this. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those afflicted by this. Allah saved me, Allah gave me another chance. It's a reminder for me, I need to get on the straight path. I need to make sure I, I check out my own situation because that could have been me. How many of us, and let's be honest, how many of us, let's say we were in LA for the weekend and we met Kobe, got to know him, mashallah. He, he seemed like a very nice guy, very professional, honestly. You, the other stuff you see from other professional athletes, you didn't see much of that for him. Some things, but not too much. Seemed like a really nice guy. So let's say you met him and he said to you, I'm going to this game with my family this week on my private uh, helicopter, would you, would you and your family like to join me? How many of us would have said yes and how many of us would have said, I would have went. Most of us would have went, subhanAllah. And we could have been there with him. We could have been there with him. Met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone here now in Qatar said, you want to take a trip on my private helicopter? How many of us would say no? Maybe now after Kobe's death, <laughs> maybe some of us might not want to go. I'd be reluctant. But before that, anybody would have got on it, right? 
It's an opportunity, never been on a helicopter before. But just like that, subhanAllah, something he's been on over a thousand times. The same helicopter that he rode from the Staples Center in LA when he played his last game and went home on the same helicopter. And that's where he met Allah, that's where he met his death at the end, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be from those who are reminded and those who benefit from these signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to us time and time again, those who return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and true repentance, and those who hold firm to their deen, and may He make us all from those who meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dying upon a deed which is pleasing to Him, and may He make us all, may, may Allah be pleased with us when He meets us.